Good evening and welcome to another episode of the Power Half Hour Unstoppable Business Owner and I'm your host Dorothy O'Dell for this evening. I am super excited to bring to the stage Susan Combs of who is president of Combs and Company. Uh, so welcome to the show Susan. Thank you so much. Good to see you. Good to see you too. So there is so much that we have in common and I love what this lady is doing. So before we get into that, Susan, if you could let our guests know a little bit about yourself um, and we'll go from there. Sure. So my name is Susan Combs. I'm originally from a teeny tiny town in the Northwest corner of Missouri population. It was 986 when I left, but I had booing metropolis of 1013 now. Um, but I, I left and I came to New York City in 2001. Um, I started my own insurance brokerage firm in 2005 at the age of 26. Um, yeah. Might be smart, might be stupid, but it worked out in the end for me. Um, but it's a full service insurance brokerage, so life and health and property and casualty. Um, I work a lot as an expert witness um, all across the country on um, high-end medical malpractice cases and things like that. And then I have some passion projects that you and I have in common. Um, I am the daughter of a major general um, that passed away from Asian orange related throat cancer. And so currently I'm doing a lot of stuff right now for, um, for a veterans clinic that I'm on the advisory board for and our whole campaign this month called Pancakes to Roger. So I know we're going to kind of get into that in a little bit too. I love all that. I didn't realize you were 26 though when you went to New York City and started your own insurance company. That's amazing. Yeah, so I went at 22 and then you know worked for a couple of people and then started my own firm um, at 26. So, and and to go from Missouri to New York City, come on, that must have been culture shock for you. <laughs> well, okay, so I went to a large. I went to University of Missouri, which is a you know large college, about 35,000 students. And I will say that I think my first weekend at school, one of the guys said, "How does it feel to have more people in this dorm building than you have in your whole town?" And that was the first time when I was like, "Oh wow, that's that's a big difference." Um, but you know. Since my dad was military and we went to a lot of different places, we were exposed to a lot of different things, big cities, small cities, you know, everything in between. Mm -hmm. um, I, I wasn't intimidated. Um, and, and so it just, it kind of worked out for me. And I really think that, that New York City is definitely has a lot of great opportunities for women. Um, and I, I just, in the United States, I just feel like it's a city that, that lets women shine, lets people, you know, lets women like excel in careers. And it's not like, hey, honey, what are you trying to sell me? like it is in the Midwest where I'm from sometimes. So, Right. That's awesome. And it says here that you've also uh, became um, woman of the, wasn't it woman, uh, the first, the youngest national president in over 85 years of the woman of insurance and financial services industry. That's amazing. Congratulations. <laughs> like, Thanks. Yeah, I think I was 35. Um, if I remember right, it was 2015. Um, so that was, I'll tell you, it was, that's probably one of the things that um, that that contributed to a lot of my success. I will say, um, just because I think the leadership opportunities that I got there, um, the speaking opportunities that I got, but it was very intimidating because, like you said, I was the youngest national president. I didn't take that opportunity light. Um, when I'm making decision, I usually have a good gut check for a lot of things, but when it's a big thing that's going to impact a lot of people, I do a lot of research. I interviewed the past seven national presidents to see what it looked like for them. And I had a mentor that pushed me and she always told me, you know, you always have to have a stretch in your life, something that's, that's bigger than you um, because that's where you really grow and build your character. So that was something that having a board that everybody was older than me on it. Um, most of the people could have been my mother. Um, it was, I, I really struggled with that because I was worried that how am I, it's going to be, Hey kid, you're going to lead us. But I was always been a leader that's uh, that has gotten my hands dirty, that never asked anybody to do something that I wasn't willing to do myself. So I got the respect of the board early on and it just all worked out. I, I love that. If, if you're not willing, if you know, you're willing to get in there and, and get like your feet wet, like you said, and, and get right in there. I think that shows a lot about yourself. And mm -hmm. I think, you know, that's probably what helped too, because a, a lot of young people nowadays don't want to do uh, anything. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. I I I work for um, a greenhouse during the day, and I'm telling you, the the worth ethic is not there today as it was years ago. You know, and I'm just like, wow, it just blows my mind. But good for you, and and that's probably what put you forward and to becoming the president for sure. Well, and you know, I think for me, 
So I'm like, I'm a cusper. So I'm like Gen X millennial type of thing. But I have a friend um, named Cam Marston that is a generational expert. And one thing he taught me like about millennials and younger generations is if they grew up like on a farm, grew up with military family or law enforcement family, or even just like manual labor type of family, they typically don't abide by the stereotypes of like, hey, give me the company car, the corner office, and I'm not going to earn it type of thing. Right. So that's something that I've always, I've always listened to. And so when I'm like, you know, interviewing people to work at my firm, um, if they're younger, I like to kind of know about their parents and what their parents did, because it really translates into a really good work, that work ethic I've found. That's awesome. So for all my HR people out there that are listening, there's a major tip right there. Uh, I just want to say a quick hey to Angel. Thanks for joining us. And Emma Fox. Oh, that was one of my girls. Yeah. <laughs> Yay. I just spent a week with Angels. Uh, she was actually with us in Arizona. And she's the one that kind of coordinated all this, the fun stuff we were doing out there. So shout out to you ladies. Thank you for joining us. Uh, and so... You're, I would call it more than a passion project. Like you've taken on something that is absolutely amazing. Your pancakes for Roger. So let's talk a little bit about that. Okay. So pancakes for Roger, the story comes from, um, from an interaction I had with my father. So my father was diagnosed with Agent Orange related throat cancer in 2008. And we had 10 relatively good years um, until we didn't. And so he relapsed twice the last year of his life. And uh, so I, moved back from, from New York, back to Missouri to help care for him when, um, when he was dying. Um, we, you know, we had him on hospice and, you know, my father had had a feeding tube for about a year and he was on oxygen. And so he and I were both the type A regimented people in our family. So I'd get up, go to the gym, you know, after I checked on him, I, after I'd come back from the gym, I check on him again. If he was good, I'd get showered, cleaned up for the day check on him again, get him rallied around and help him with his, his tube feeding and get him in his chair for the day. But one morning after I'd come back from the gym and he was good and I showered and I came down and I went to his hospital bed because we were very fortunate enough to have hospice at home. So he was able to stay in his home environment. Um, he wasn't in his hospital bed and I rounded the corner and he wasn't in the living room. <laughs> and so I kept moving on until I went to the kitchen and he was sitting there and he had a placemat and he had a silverware and he had set the table. And I looked at him and I said, you know, dad, what are you doing? And he said, I want pancakes for breakfast. And um, <sighs> this man never asked for anything. And he, he had the feeding tube for over a year and he never once complained about not being able to eat. And um, I looked at him and I said, oh, dad, there's just nothing in this world that I want to give you than pancakes for breakfast. But I said, we're on hospice. We have a, a DNR. I said, you have a feeding tube. I said, if you choke, we're done here. And I just don't think we're quite ready to be done. And he said, well, oh yes, I can. He said, Matt said I could. So Matt's my brother and he's a nurse and he wasn't there that morning. So I knew we were dealing with some confusion because his oxygen level had got too low. So I said, well, let me see what I could do. So I went to the microwave and I heated up the tube feeding formula for 14 seconds as the general wanted, never 15, never 13, never 10. He would know <laughs> he wanted 14 seconds. So I brought it over the table and I put it on the table and he said, what's that? And I said, well, that's your syrup. So his oxygen levels had kind of started rallying around and he kind of smiled and he understood and he said, okay. So about three weeks later, he passed away and um, my brother and my sister-in-law, my mother were all with him. And, um, and after we made the funeral arrangements for his Missouri funeral, um, because my father um, is buried at Arlington National Cemetery in Washington, D.C. And uh, I came back to New York and I took one day off work. And I, I figured I just needed a one day reset because those out there that have been caregivers know it's just, it's exhausting. And mm -hmm. so my husband said, why don't we go have some pancakes for your dad? And so we went to the Bel Air Diner in Queens, New York, um, our favorite diner. And that's where kind of the whole concept of Pancakes for Roger started. My husband took a picture. I told about the interaction with my father on social media. And I said, if you're so inclined, why don't you go have some Pancakes for Roger and remember about the little things in life? Because we all know that life can change in the blink of an eye, especially military families when people are deployed. And at the end of the day, it's the, the little things that can make the biggest impact. So that's where the concept of Pancakes for Roger started. And then it kind of blew, blew up, uh, blew up pretty quick. So my father's birthday um, is actually coming up. It's on February 22nd. 
And so um, what we started doing is the month of February, every single year for every pancake loving picture that we get on social media with people using the hashtag pancakes for Roger, then my company makes a donation to a veterans clinic at the University of Missouri School of Law that provides free legal services um, and discharge upgrades for our veterans that are navigating the VA claims and appeals process. So it started as just kind of like a fun, nice thing um, to do. And then, um, and then I decided to write a book <laughs> and um, because, you know, I wasn't busy enough. And um, but to be honest, like with the book, it was a cathartic process for me. I think that a lot of times when there's multiple kids in a family, there is a child that ends up kind of stepping into the, the parent's role that passes and kind of handles a lot of the things. Since my thought process was very similar to my father, I was that one. I mean, my brothers would tell you at 10 years old, they knew I was that one um, because it's just how I, how I operated. And so um, I decided to write a book last year as a tribute to him. And actually it, it didn't start out as a tribute to him. It started out as a tribute to mentors um, and just kind of fun advice, quick hits, like quotes that I've gotten from different people along the way that have impacted my life. And then my dad in general fashion took over the whole freaking book and <laughs> where he was supposed to be a chapter, but he ended up, he's, he's throughout the, throughout the entire book. And then um, I have other mentors that are sprinkled in as well. Well, Wow. As you're sharing the story again with me, it's the first time for our audience, but I'm sitting here and I got chills because I, I, I'm not sure if I shared this with you, but um, we had my dad home to die. He ended up, he had lung cancer, ended up with liver cancer um, metastasized through his body. And we, we didn't, it was going so rapid. We didn't have uh, a chance to do anything else. So we kept them at home. Uh, so when you said the caregivers, I was like, that's why I got tears in my eyes. Like I can picture your dad and I can picture my dad and, and it is, it is something. And, you know, I could have you for only taking a day. I needed a couple of days, <laughs> uh, to, to wrap my head around all that because, uh, you're right. You know, your dad is your biggest hero. And then when he's, you know, the head of the household and like your dad, he's a, the a sergeant major. I mean, like, wow, like it's, it's, um, I, I get it. And, um, yeah, it, it, it's, it's those moments that like the kinship with that, it, it, it's, it's undescribable unless you've gone through it. You, you really have no idea. <laughs> yeah, it's a club. I mean, it's just like, and I talk about that in the book. I said, it's the dead dad club that nobody knows. You never know about this club until you're indoctrinated. And it's the shittiest club that you never want to join. But it's this, you know, it's this underground thing. And I'll tell you the people that really helped me the most. I mean, I, you know, I have my crew that was so supportive after I lost my father, but you know, and I was in my thirties still when my dad passed. And I know that there's people that have lost their fathers at, you know, young ages, didn't even know their dads and things like that. But in my circle, I was really the first one to, or still the only one to have lost their father for the most part. And so it was, you know, they were, they were supportive and they were, they were loving and they showed up for me big time, but they didn't know what I was going through. And so it was really the people that I didn't anticipate that helped me the most. I mean, people that are almost like perimeter friends or people that I grew up with that, you know, you're on touch with on, on social media, but you don't really, you know, you don't really have like a day-to-day -day interaction. Those were the ones that really showed up for me. And, and that taught me to show up for other people. And so when I see on social media, when somebody loses a parent or loses a, a spouse or a sibling, I, I reach out privately. Um, because I remember like, God, I mean, you know, I mean, it's just like, people will be like, you post something on social media and people are making comments. You freaking can't even remember your name half the day, yeah. let alone like read everything and respond to it. But I found that when people reached out to me privately, I was able to like make the space for that. So it, it made me know that, you know, that's a better way to reach out and then also to continue to reach out. Because I think that a lot of times, and it's, I, I mean, this isn't a dig and this isn't meant in a derogatory matter at all, but people move on with their lives and they didn't lose their dad, but it's just like, it's the two months, six months, year later, you know, the anniversaries that come up, those are the times that it's, it's really nice to still hear from somebody to check on you. And only the people in the club know that. Yeah. And then it's something you just said reminded me of, um, I have a friend too that lost her husband um, not that 
just shortly before my dad had passed away. And she said that she used to keep track of, you know, the third, the, Oh, we've gone through a week. Oh, we've gone through a month, like three, 30 days, 60 days. And the thing of it is the reason why she, she put into words what that really meant. That meant that, okay, so a year later, here I am, I'm still standing. And I can actually say that, you know, it's, it sucks, but you know, you, you got through it. Um, which when she said that, I was like, yeah, that's be And I noticed myself carrying those like milestones. Right. And here we are a year and a little bit later. And, uh, it's, it's just like, and it still doesn't feel real. I feel like he's going to walk through the door at any moment and say, fooled ya, April fools or something. Um, and my dad was always sick though. So, you know, growing up that it was normal for being in the hospital or whatever for a week or whatever. I mean, obviously not a year, but it just feels like it's the shittiest feeling in the world. But I also know that, Hey, he's out there watching over us. And, and uh, I found that in that, uh, in those nine days that we had with him, um, his last nine days, I, I, there's only so much you could like, you can't, you can't be in the room 24 seven, you'll drive yourself crazy. So I found that going for walks and on my walks, I would just start doing like a reel and um, just saying what was on my heart. And a lot of people responded and said, thank you for sharing that because, you know, I'm going through this too. And, you know, your words really helped me. And I said to my mom, I said, well, we're going through this so that we can help somebody else. And she goes, well, I'm not ready for that. You can, but I'm not ready for that yet. So, um, you know, and I think what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. So. so my mother has a neighbor that is, I believe she's 96, 97 years old, and she's been widowed twice. Oh. So she was widowed the first time um, her husband went off to World War II and never came home. And then she was married to another man for, oh, I think, 70 years. And, you know, she's really helped my mother. And she said, you know, honey, you'll never get over it, but you'll get through it. And so those are things that I've, I've kind of hung on to. And, you know, and like you said, I mean, it's just like, you know, you know, it's not going to kill you, but man, some days you feel like you could just snap in two. And, you know, only the people that have gone through it understand that. And it's just like, it's, there's just no pain like that. And it's just, I mean, you know, I've heard people talking about losing a child and, and losing a spouse. And, you know, so it's, it's different loss. And so I think that that's why it's important to connect with people that are in that space. Like I, I haven't lost a spouse, so I can't support my mother in that way. I can, right. I can try, but it's just like, she can get more support and comfort from people that are also widows because they've been through it. Right. Well, and what I said to my mom, like she, she was upset with herself while well, she was hiding her depression really good at the beginning until she couldn't anymore. And then uh, I was just like, okay, it's time for me to step in and make sure you get the help that you really need. Um, and so I, I said to her and she was mad. She goes, well, I, I can't believe I'm still like this six months later. I said, you were with him for 50 years. What makes you think you can get over somebody like that in 50 years? Yeah. You know, and, 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 it's just being paid. And I don't know, I think we're kind of similar in, in a lot of different ways. And it's frustrating in, in one sense, because you don't know how to communicate with the surviving spouse. And in the same time, you're going through your own hell. And I have a spouse that's supportive, but it's like, doesn't like it sh me showing emotion when I'm like, really hurting like that uh so it's just like finding that balance and thank god for friends like you said because mm -hmm. friends have been the world of difference yeah, I uh, people, like you know if you don't have friends you can ugly cry with you need new friends i mean it's exactly. just like and, and like you said like you did the reels um i wrote a lot and so i write for a magazine called benefits pro and they really gave me the space to share about that and so i you know, I was just, I, I wrote one article that was just like, you know, for those of you that are going to be in my shoes in the future. And it was just like things like get all the passwords, you know, have yes. those hard conversations. Like, no, I mean, and that's one of the things that I tell people all the time is I sat down with my dad twice before he passed away. 
And it, oh, it was gut wrenching and it was hard, but I spreadsheeted everything to who the plumber was, who the electrician was, who do I sell the pickup truck to? Who do I talk to about like, it, you know, selling the Winnebago, like all these things that it's just like the, he was the, you know, keeper of the keys to the castle. And so I was so fortunate that we did those things because then I knew exactly what he wanted on his headstone. I knew exactly who he wanted to sing at his funeral. Like those things. I mean, God, I mean, we used, he and I, like he had a home office. And so he and I, I mean, I remember (laughs) when I went the first time because he was getting ready to have another surgery and we didn't know if he was going to be able to speak after that. And so he, you know, threw a legal pad at me and a pen. He's like, get to writing. And I was like, how about I do a spreadsheet? (laughs) I was like, I'm better with a spreadsheet. So, you know, we kind of went through those things and then, you know, we, we did it again. Um, you know, and it's even just like, God, I mean, we set up a trust, um, literally the, a, a day before we triggered hospice. And, um, because my father was, he was also a civilian judge. And when he was attorney, he set up countless trusts, but he had never done it for himself. And so that was going through that process and kind of being the quarterback on that. I really understood what we were looking at because, you know, <laughs> I love my dad, but there were seven bank accounts and eight properties. There was a lot of stuff. And then there was like, you know, there was Arlington, there was Department of Defense. He had the general pension and he had a judge's pension. And there were all these things that I was like, oh God, okay. I I had to be indoctrinated into farming 101 because now I like manage my, my mother's farm. My mother's from Washington, DC and Chicago. So she's not a farm girl. And so (laughs) I deal that. And then we have a family farm that my cousins and I manage for our mother's. And so it was like learning that stuff um, that I just, you know, I didn't plan on managing farms from New York City <laughs> um, in my, my, you know, late 30s, early 40s. But it's, you know, it's all kind of worked out. Yeah. Uh, and you're, you're right. It's those hard conversations that we actually do have to have. Because I, I said to my dad, I said, do you have everything written down? He knew what I meant. And he's just like, it's on the pad underneath the, underneath the computer. I'm like, for sure, everything, the bank passwords, everything, because my dad did it all. Yes, he says. So, of course, once he passes away, I didn't go check. I took his word for it. He passes away. We couldn't find something. I'm like, I told you to just, you just had one job to do. <laughs> and, like I was saying this, like, out in my head to him, but he's gone. Obviously, he can't hear me. And um, so it's funny, like, a couple weeks later, we found what we were looking for. I'm like, sorry, dad, I knew you wouldn't let me down. (laughs) And I had to check that back, but, uh, well, I had, so my dad had a password locker on his, um, on his phone. So I had the, the, I had the password to the password locker, but then I just, I took my phone and I took so many pictures of things because I was like, okay, I need to be able to like have this accessible. Um, but it's just, oh my God, it's, it's like so much work. It is so much work. And that's one of the things that people don't, don't realize. I mean, mm-hmm. it is a ton of work, especially if, I mean, it's one thing if it's like one house and one bank account. I mean, hell, I could do that with my eyes closed at this point after dealing with all that. But I remember one week on a Friday, I talked to my brother, Matt, and I was like exhausted. And he was like, so how was your week? And I was like, I logged 14 hours talking to Arlington, the department of the defense, you know, like dealing with all like the IRS, like social security, just like all this stuff. And he, he was just like, well, do you need any help? And I'm like, well, not now. <laughs> you know, he's like 14 hours later, I'm good, you know, but it's just, it's those things that, but I will say that what I did for myself is I, that first year I put in four hours of family office time into my calendar. And so I did that every Tuesday and Thursday afternoon, because the thing is, it's just like, I knew my mother was going to get all this mail. She wasn't going to know what to do. She was going to be stressed out. She was going to be concerned. And so she knew I had that time carved out for her. So it's just like, so it, because my mother would have been blowing up my phone every 10 minutes with something. And so she knew that was her time. And so, you know, she would have a list. And so when it was the family office time, I would call her. I'm like, okay, you ready? Like, and so I'm like, what you got for me? And so then if I had any questions or things like that, and then also it made me, I showed up for my family a lot. So I also need to show up for my business and I need to show up for myself. So I need to be able to work. So by making it into those time blocks, it made it just so much better and easier to maneuver for myself too. 
And not to mention, you now can transfer that to your your clients. You know, like when when you're talking to your clients, you can say, okay, I would add this and this and this to Mm -hmm. what you're doing. Because I mean, with insurance and, and, and things like that, you could just make side notes for them too and say, you know, an added value uh, because you've gone through it. You know what needs to happen, right? Mm-hmm. So I think that's what what we use in our, in our home life, we use in our business life for sure, <laughs> you know, and be able to help them and give them the extra, extra space. So that's awesome. So what... Um, you said life insurance. What? Where can? Where's the best pay, place for people to get a hold of you um, if they want it for all their insurance needs? Then. Yeah. So I mean, yeah, we handle everything. Um, so it's just like I mean, I would say like life insurance and that type of stuff um, was about like one or two percent. Um, people lie, and I don't like that. <laughs> They're like, oh, I'm healthy as a horse. No, you're not. <laughs> you find that out after underwriting. But um, yeah. You know, so uh, my website is uh, combsandco.com. So www.combsandco.com. Um, so that's the best way to, to connect with me. That has like all of our social media handles. And um, we have a lot of fun on social media. Um, so it's just like, so we do kind of some some cool things. And then, yeah, I mean, it's it's inundated with pancakes to Roger right now. So you'll see a lot of pictures um, from all over the world with people enjoying pancakes. Um Hey, we got, we got, uh, France and Portugal this morning. So that was kind of cool. And I have a friend that was like in Thailand. So he got me Thailand and, and I mean, a lot of military people are stationed overseas too. So we get people that kind of tap into that. Um, but I was more impressed that we got Hawaii on day one. I was like, I didn't anticipate that. That's usually one of our hard States to get, but, um, we had, um, I'll tell you, I'm not Mormon, but I do have friends that are Mormon and, um, I utilize that community pretty well on the pancakes or Roger when I need a state because they have their missionaries in every single state out there. So they, they help me out when I need to, you know, get an obscure place like Delaware or South Dakota too. Well, I love that. And you got to use, you got to use, uh, utilize everything, right? Cause that's why we network where that's why we network all over the, the world. Right. Yeah. So that's awesome. So yeah, don't forget to, um, Take your pictures of your eating your pancakes and send them with the hashtag pancakes for Roger uh, so that Susan can see that. And I, I love what you're doing. I Like I said, I've, I've been through, um, I serve on a veteran uh, board. So I, I've told them and we're on board with that. And I know, um, you know, I'm not done yet. We're still, we're still, I'm still working across the rest of my veteran uh, communities that I have too. So. By the 22nd, we'll have it covered. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, we're, man, we're like, so it's just like, so we, we spread, you know, the spreadsheet, something shocker, right? Uh, but it's just like, so we're up, I think almost like 30% on the picture count over last year already. And so, um, and I think we are, we're up to like 39 states and 15 countries. So that's pretty cool. Last year, we ended up with, um, with 50 states and 18 countries, including, or 17 countries, including the U- US. So we're, we're on board to, to really kind of blow the doors off. Um, but it's, you know, it's cool. And so, um, the other thing I will say is like, even if people are like listening to this day and not everybody has social media, so that's okay. If they go to the website, um, www.pancakesroger.com, they can actually upload pictures that way too. So we get people that do that, or, uh, we get grandmas that are like, you know, get their grandkids involved to text me pictures or send pictures. And so that's been a lot of fun too. But the only thing I will say, it has to be a public facing um, uh, social media outlet. So if somebody has it private, we're never going to be able to pull the hashtag. So we always say like post it publicly because then it helps get the word out too. But LinkedIn, LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. um, We even have a couple of TikTok videos of people eating pancakes that have been kind of fun. So Um, we, and we love people getting creative. So the one thing we do say is like, not everybody likes pancakes. So we, um, kimchi pancakes work, um, scallion pancakes work. Some people have done crepes. We lovingly call, um, waffles pancakes with abs. (laughs) So that, that works too. Um, and I also have a friend that is like, they're like, they're vegan and they're, they're vegetarian and they're gluten-free. And so they mashed up like all these vegetables and made like a vegetable pancake. Um, I live in New York city. So we have a big Jewish community here. We've had potato pancakes, latkes. I mean, it's just been, it's been fun to get people. Um, I have a friend that was down in Argentina and they were like, it looks like a pancake. They're like, we think it's a potato, 
but it looks like a pancake and we're calling it pancakes for Roger. I said, that works for me. <laughs> so it's been a lot of fun. I love that. Angel says uh, to contact Cousins Tease Pancakes about support. Oh, where is that? Angel, where is Cousin T Pancakes? What state or what country? Um, she's from Indiana, but that doesn't mean anything because she's all over the world. She yeah. goes to UK. She goes to Phoenix. She goes everywhere. So um, I'm CrossFit. And so CrossFit people, we like to eat um, for sure. So, um, so the CrossFit community also supports um, supports it. So we get to see some of those athletes actually post pictures too. So that's a lot of fun. Awesome. And how about IHOP? I just thought of that. Like, because IHOP is the pancake place pancake capital i you know i mean i don't think we're quite i hop ready yet um but it's just like because <laughs> like i said i'd have to probably have to take out a loan if we get i hop to, to back us up um but uh you know but i do we do get a lot of pictures from my hop i will say so we get people that that do denny's and perkins and and you know everywhere in between and so it's it's and then also too i'm like over in europe there's there's like pancake houses that do like savory pancakes and that's kind of cool too. So it's, it's been a lot of fun for sure. Awesome. I love that. Do you have Canada on board yet? Yes. Yes. We got it. We got it. You know, I mean, New York, we're like neighbors. So it's just, oh, that's like, true. yeah. So, um, and I have a lot of new friends. we did get, but like, we always want more from Canada. So cause you that's guys right. have all the syrup and everything up there too. Well, that is true. That is true. And it's funny because I was, I was, sharing your story with my stepson and my husband when I was making homemade pancakes. However, it was just before February. So I didn't take a picture. They never eat pancakes. And all of a sudden he wanted pancakes for dinner. So I made them from scratch. Nice. From scratch, ladies and gentlemen, I can still do that. Uh, and so I did that and I, I actually tasted that. I'm not really a pancake fanatic, no, really. uh, but I tasted it. I'm like, damn, that's pretty good. <laughs> Like I will say, like at our diner that we love so much, they put malt and vanilla in theirs, and there's something about that malt flavor that's just really, really good. So I, when I make them at home, I do uh, maple flavoring. So I do maple and and butter and vanilla and stuff like that. But I mean, I will tell you, I'm not gonna lie, I'm I'm not the greatest pancake maker. I try, I try a lot, and then I, but one of my cousins taught me that using club soda is kind of a, a kind of a good hint because then it, it, with the bubbles, it makes them really super fluffy and light. So oh. I'll, I'll keep trying. I mean, when somebody's like, Oh, I need your best pancake recipe. I'm like, you don't want it from me. <laughs> like I can make a lot of other things, but I'm just like, I'm still the one that, you know, like always the first one's ugly. Right. Um, oh, totally. Yeah. It's just, you know, it works out in the end though. Uh, and then like my guys are very fussy. So if it's even a little bit dark, then it's they're not going to eat it so i'm like psh, 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 into the garbage <laughs> uh, angel says there's a it's online and uh, she has a few places there in illinois and she'd like to connect with you so we we'll can i'll connect you to you on linkedin afterwards um but yes thank you so much for coming on uh susan i absolutely love what you're doing um and definitely go get her book too which i believe is on pancakesforroger.com right yeah it's too right there we go yeah there so it's just like so you can buy it on amazon so we have we have the audiobook we have the um we have the kindle and then we have a hardback and softback so they can get it on amazon.com um they can also go to the pancakes for roger website and then it'll link you to that um and then you know if anybody's wanting to do uh bulk orders uh we can do that too because we do get um, a lot of places that have been doing it for kind of some leadership um, type of workbook type of work. So that's kind of cool. I love all that. I'm going to have to download it to my Kindle, get it and download it to my Kindle. Uh, yeah, so that it on the audiobook. So if you, you know, oh. if you like my voice, I mean that, and I'll tell you, that was a lot of fun. Uh, so to get to be in the studio and do that. Um, and it was, it was exhausting, but it was just, um, was, yeah. And then, or for the, just to tell of myself. Um, so like when you're recording an audiobook, there was like so many things I learned when I did this. And so, um, you know, I like in high school and stuff like that, I did acting and, um, I've always done a lot of videos. And so I used to be on, on camera talent for ehow.com. And so I'm pretty good with like going off the cuff and doing things. But when you're doing an audiobook, they're your stories. So sometimes you want to elaborate, but you can't like, you have mm -hmm. to read the book. And so <laughs> 
posterity is a word that I'm not good at saying. And so it's just like, we laughed because after I did the audiobook, they said, okay, you got to come back for the fixes. And so they were like 15 fixes. And of course I'm super competitive. So I'm like, is that good? And they're like, oh, Susan, usually people have like 50, a hundred, you did great. I'm like, okay, you know, give me the award. And so, um, but we had to do the fixes. I got all the fixes done in 10 minutes, but nine minutes were spent on that word posterity. And so I kept saying posterity. And they're like, there's no R. And I'm like, yes, there is. And they're like, well, not where you're putting it. And so it was like, they're in my ear and they're like, pasta, pasta. It's like pasta. And so I'm like, so I, I'm saying it like to myself, like Rain Man. I'm like, pasta, pasta, pasta for posterity. And they're like, I was like, I get it. And they're like, nope. And they're like, pasta, posterity. Nope. And like, I mean, this went around and around and around and around. And it was like hilarious. And I was like, why the hell we put that na- that word in the book? I was like, I don't even say that word. I was like, I write it, but I don't say it. I was like, I will never, but now I can say that word. So it just took me nine minutes of practicing to get to get it right. I love that. I I have not done, um, the ebook the uh the audio online and it's funny because someone said uh uh, have you thought of writing it in spanish and i'm like no (laughs) yeah Yeah, it's funny well it's so funny because it just like i think the first two countries that came out were germany and iran and i'm like okay i'm like it's just random um but it's like it's it's on like 50 different audiobook uh channels but like you know audible and and you know, audiobooks.com and everything, like all the big ones. But, and I'll tell you the, the main reason why I did that is I, I hadn't planned on doing it, but I had friends that came to me and they had um, dyslexic children. And so they asked me, they said, these are great lessons that I'd want to share with our girls, but they have a really hard time reading. And so I was like, you know what, that's something I can do. And so it was kind of cool to be able to like share it in different, different ways so that, you know, even if you have trouble with reading, you can just listen to it. And so many people, I mean, with, with listening to things, and I always tell people, if you don't have time to read the book, just go on our Instagram account or TikTok or wherever. We release a video every single week and it's a chapter. So eventually you'll be through the book if you want to do it that way too. Right. Well, and your mantra, do more better. So I, I can to- so, totally see that in you, like with everything that you've shared. Um, I, I love that. I absolutely love that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, it's just, I think that sometimes it's like, so um, David uh, Goggins is, I'm a a fan of his. I mean, in the veterans community, a lot of people know who he is. I mean, he was, you know, he's a former Navy SEAL, special forces, um, ultra marathon runner, and we actually have the same publisher. And, um, and so that's one of his kind of, I mean, not to do more better, but he's basically like anything that you're doing, you're really only at 80% of your potential. There's always more that you can do. There's always more that you can tap in. There's always one more mile that you can run. There's always one more project, one more, uh, you know, phone Mm -hmm. call that you can make. And so it's, it was kind of cool that we ended up with the same publisher because we kind of have a little bit of the same mindset. So there's always more that you can do. I mean, when people say they're busy, I kind of want to be like, eh, are you, you know, because I'm like, we are all busy. So you can't even use that as an excuse. I mean, with, with, with social media and with uh, just the connectivity of everything, it's just like, everybody's always busy. So it's just like, you kind of got to decide what's going to be important to you and what's going to, you know, what you want your legacy to look like and what you want to leave behind. I, I absolutely love that. And I'm of the one that says I'm always busy, but I mean, I could write a list of what I do during the day and pe- my aunt goes, I don't know how you do half of it. Yeah. And I'm just, well, because I have a goal and like, I'm not stopping until the goal's done. And then there'll be something else on my plate that I want to do. Right. How do you get yes. something done? You ask a busy woman. Right. I mean, that's, it's so true. I mean, we figure it out. We always figure it out. Yeah. And no matter how busy I am, I'll find time for myself too. Yeah. Yeah, because I, that that is important and and just like i shared with you 30 hours of sleep last week is what we got i'm just like i'm tired this week but mm-hmm. and being valentine's day i i skipped on, on our board meeting and okay. i said guys i'm i'm it's valentine's day and my husband's like aren't you supposed to be in your office tonight i'm like i gave up everything for you oh you're like actually you gave up everything to go to bed early <laughs> 
<laughs> we took his son home uh, after uh, seven thirty, and we came home and we went to bed. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, I'll tell you, I'm, I like we were, I was saying that I, there's like eight days this month I'm home, and so like I'm actually leaving for Mexico tomorrow morning. I'm gonna get up like three thirty, four o'clock in the morning, um, to fly down to an expat community um, for for a pancakes for Roger event, and then I literally get back at. Like I'll be home probably one in the morning on Tuesday. And then I get on a flight about 11 hours later uh, to go somewhere else for pancakes or Roger stuff. So it's, it's definitely a labor of love. Um, people that think like, Oh, you travel with work uh, and they romanticize it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's great. Um, it's great when you like have a hotel room by yourself and then you can be like, Oh, let me get in my pajamas by seven o'clock at night and, um, <laughs> and shut out the world. Um, so that's, that's like a plus of, of traveling for work, but it's, it's definitely you're on all the time. And I think too, like with this, with a lot of the speaking opportunities I've had, I mean, this month is an emotional month for me. Um, and so it always feels like tears are just right under the surface. Somebody just pushes me a little bit and then it's, it's on. Um, and so I, I was actually talking to my mother and I, I said to her, I was like, do you think this is easy for me? I was like, just because you're good at it doesn't mean it's not hard. And, mm -hmm. you know, I think that that's something that the people just don't even think about sometimes that, you know, when you're doing something that you're passionate about, it's, you know, it's a piece of your heart. And, um, and so, and also too, like when you're, when you know that the work that you're doing is helping veterans and impacting veterans, I mean, it's, it's very emotional for, for me and my family because I, we want to help veterans just like my dad. I mean, my dad's claim with the VA took three years and we thought that was crazy. But then when you go on the VA website, they say average claims take seven years. I mean, 14% of our veterans die during that process. Yeah. And so it's just like... A lot of times, especially in the civilian world, I mean, and I live in New York City. I love New York City, but it's not as much rah-rah military as the area I grew up in, in Northwest Corner, Missouri. And so it's just like, it's it's different. And a lot of my friends that I have here, they just, they can't relate because they weren't exposed to the things that I was exposed to. But the older I get, the more I appreciate how I was raised um, because we definitely got the best of both worlds because we had a house in Missouri, six miles from the farm that my father was literally born on, but we got to see the world. And my dad made it clear to us that, Hey, if you want to go out and spread your wings and go slay some dragons and, and see the world, that's fine. And if you want to come back home, there's no shame in that too. So I think sometimes people get stuck. And I, I also think, I mean, I don't want to be critical to parents, but I think sometimes they push their own wants and hopes and dreams on their children instead of like letting the children find their own way and figuring it out. And so my parents are always good about that, where it's just, you know, do what makes you happy, but know that the, it doesn't have to be it doesn't have to be such a big life is what I, you know, I'm trying to say. Like, you don't have to be the rock star and on Good Morning America and like doing all these things like it's you know, it's just what's going to make you happy. And I think that sometimes people just, um, they don't know themselves enough to figure out what makes them happy. So you really have to sit with yourself and kind of figure out those things too. I love that you said that because the whole reason why I became a bookkeeper was my dad's like, well, why don't you be a bookkeeper? Cause you'll never be without a job. Mm -hmm. So here I am almost 30 years later and I'm like, I am done with bookkeeping. <laughs> Like, I am done. I hope you are watching. <laughs> <laughs> That's my day job. My day job is that. So my my new thing that I'm rolling into is like productions and and uh, shows and and things like that. And which like I was lit up like a Christmas tree all week, getting to do a whole solid week of things that I absolutely love. Right, and meeting people like meeting retired NFL players and meeting and who were veterans to, to begin with too, like veterans and NFL players. And, and, uh, three, uh, Trent is a, a three time world series coach. I'm like, he comes in with his rings on and he's just like, I said, can I take a picture of those? So he's like this, I'm like, way to go. I'm like, this is the stuff that, I could like eat, sleep and breathe and not even consider work. So wow. yeah, only having 30 hours of sleep was, was okay because I was like, full, it was like, I was running on adrenaline and I'm like, this is awesome. Let's keep, keep going, Just going to the PGA tour. Like who does that? Okay. Right. Taking picture of burns when he's like 10 feet behind you, he's mm -hmm. in the rough. Like, like it's those things that, 
you know, my dad never, my dad was always, okay, you work for somebody else, you work 30 years, put your time in, you collect a pension and get out. They had no idea when it come to be like an entrepreneur, you want to work for yourself or you're dumb. Like, why would you want that? Like, why would you want the hassle? <laughs> don't get me started that's a whole other show but anyways <laughs> that's by doing your career and everything like that then it then it affords you to be able to work towards your passion i mean do i think i'm going to sell insurance for the rest of my life probably not um do i have a passion and a desire to start a nonprofit for veterans yes when it's the right time and so i have in my head what i want to do um but it's like kind of like fact finding and doing some work with some other veterans organizations and seeing like how there can be potential partnerships down the road. Um, but when, when the time's right, because if, if you haven't like figured it out, like I don't half ass anything. And, um, and when I do something, I do it right. So right. I, especially when it's going to impact other people. So I, that's something that I think is really, really important for, for me. And anytime people are looking for a passion project. And like you said, I mean, when you love something, it doesn't feel like work. And I mean, I love what I do like professionally, like with the, with the insurance and the expert witness work. I mean, that's a lot of fun. The expert witness stuff is fun because I get to be a strategist and that really lights me up. Um, but I've, I've found how to work um, with things that, that, that make me happy, but then also allow for kind of the passion. But like you said, you always find time for yourself. I mean, what I'm not a new year's resolution person, but I'm a goal setter. And so like I have goals for myself, but then one of the things for goal for me this year is like doing more creative things. So mm -hmm. um, do you know what a temperature blanket is? I feel like I no. should pull it out. Okay. So a temperature <laughs> blanket is basically whatever the temperature of the day is, where you live, you pick a color and like you knit or crochet a line. And so it's just like, so you, you establish the colors for like you, like a, a four to six degree range. And then when it's that temperature for the day, like that's the line. So it's just like, so I've been doing that like twice a week and it makes you, you know, unplug, be off social media, like be present, be working with your hands, doing something creative. And so it's going to be 365 rows and I'm going to have a blanket on uh, New Year's Eve. So that's, you know, that's stuff awesome. like that. I mean, it's so it's just I try to do those things because like last year during open enrollment, my life was rough um, because anybody that does insurance and knows open enrollment knows it's rough. Um, but I made Christmas ornaments. So it was just like something that is totally unrelated. And so that's one of the things like when I mentor people, I always talk about like, hey, if you're doing like bookkeeping or whatever, or you're doing like a desk job, like what's something totally unrelated that'll get your brain working in a different way. Like what's, what's a creative thing? Like, you know, or I work out a lot too. So it's just like, what's something that you can tap into? Because I think that makes you a more well-rounded person and also makes you happier because you're more balanced that way too. I, I love that. Now, so do you have a morning routine that you normally do? <laughs> no. Yeah. Uh, so I get up at 515 every day. Actually, no, it, like as of today, it's 510 because um, my therapist wants me to start uh, meditating. So I told her I'd give her five minutes. Um, so I'm working on that because I get, yeah, like, I mean, serious. I, I'm not a yoga person. I get too distracted. I start thinking about things. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to start doing box breathing, which is like a military thing um, mm -hmm. and do that. And we'll see where it leads. So I get up at 5, 10, 5, 15 every day. Um, and I go to the gym. Uh, my class is at six, come back from there. Um, I do a uh, fellowship with the community after that for uh, 7.30. I'm actually in recovery. Um, I've been sober over 20 years. And so I do a recovery meeting at 7.30 in the morning. And then uh, I usually head into the office around nine, uh, work all day. And then, um, but I usually leave the office like around four o'clock because I also know I'm going to be working when I get home. It's just kind of the nature of the beast. I have a lot of international clients. So I, I do respond to some emails at that, you know, 530 in the morning, because if I want to get response back from my international clients, I have to do that early. Um, and then uh, Thursdays are my day off. So that is um, the day off from the gym. And then Saturdays, you know, my husband would love it if I would sleep in until seven, but that usually doesn't happen because the internal alarm clock, but yeah, I'm, I am type A to the nth degree and it's, I'm, you know, I shouldn't be ashamed of it because I get a lot of shit done that way, but, um, no but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very scheduled. I mean, and if it's not the calendar, it doesn't happen. So my calendar is color coded. It's, um, you know, would make people's, you know, eyes bug out. I think at certain times, um, you know, people that don't have like 
people that are kind of clocking in, clocking out on a job, I think when they look at calendars like ours, like they're like, how, how, like it's, but it's just, that's what works for me. And it doesn't work for everybody. And you want yeah. me to be spontaneous. I'm not your girl. <laughs> you know? I, I love what you said about the color coding because my business partner is like, you really need to get your schedule like more condensed after work. I'm like, I get it. But, you know, I, anyways, I, so I, I wish I was like that regimen, but I'm up at like 4 or 15 every morning. I do my meditation. I do my gratitude. Then I go into this to the other room and I do like 15, 30 minutes of some kind of walking, walk out a workout video, hop into my office for 10, 15 minutes, do what I have to do on social media since I am a social media girl. Yeah. Um, right. Get that done. Go cuddle with the husband for about 10 minutes and off to work we go. So yeah. I, I get that. And then I come home and depending on what night I have, I have meetings as soon as I get home, then I make dinner and then meetings till I go to bed. So. Yeah, that, see, and I will say that I, w that I don't, I mean, never say never. Right. But for the most part, I don't respond to clients after 6 PM. Um, so it's just like, so I am fiercely and I don't work on the weekends. So it's just like, I am, I mean, are there always exceptions to the rule? And I do a lot of work in California. So does the phone ring sometimes at nine o'clock followed by like a, Oh crap, Susan, I forgot you're on the East Coast type of thing. Yes, mm -hmm. does that happen? But it's more like the exception to the rule. Um, so I think that people do need to be protective of their home life. Um, and and I'm that way with my staff. Like I always tell my staff, I'm like, if you respond to a client at eight o'clock at night, they're always going to expect you to respond at eight o'clock at night. And that's your fault. That's not theirs. You got to train your clients. So it's just like I I think that people should value their, their home life and they should, you know, be protective of that time. And I, and I am, so I expect, and I'm, so I'm very protective of my staff people's time too, because I don't, you know, I don't bug them on a Sunday, you know, even unless there's like an emergency and like, Hey, I'm not coming in cause I'm sick type of thing in the morning. Um, but for the most part, it's just like, you know, we have to be protective of that because we do, we do need to invest in ourselves. We do need to take care of ourselves. Yeah, absolutely. Sundays are not, don't even bother me. <laughs> yeah, don't, noon. I know if I text yeah. her, I'm going to hear back on Monday. And I'm like, that's fine. You know? Yep. No, I get it. Uh, totally get it. And Friday nights, I don't really work either. That's, that's more like my spouse, my husband and my time and, and stuff like that. So yeah, I just, I, I could schedule more things in there, color code it and make it all look pretty, but Oh, well, I mean, you know, I think, we, I think you should color code just because you have a lot of moving parts. So like, I have like a pancake Sir Roger color. I have like a networking color. I have an expert witness color. I have prospect color. I have networking color. I mean, I have family office color. I have speaking engagement color. I mean, because then at least like when I glance at it, like we do, like I call it, um, Friday forecast because we look in at the calendar for the following week on Fridays and see where we're at. So it's just like, so if say the insurance um, appointments are light, okay, then what can we add on there? Or if like, say my expert witness stuff, um, hey, I have some blocks that are open because I schedule out my cases. Um, usually, I mean, I'm scheduled out pretty much six weeks in advance now, but if I got something done early, okay, what can we shift forward type of thing? Um, so that's been something that's been helpful for me. It also like gives me like kind of a, you know, kind of a, I don't know. It, I guess I get to anticipate what's coming up. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing we do is we file all the emails. So by Friday, when, when we're walking out the door, everything's been filed. So that's just a very freeing experience because then it's just like to look at a zero email inbox is pretty cool. And then it's that just like be. you go into the weekend without stress. I like that too. I, I love that. Yeah. I, I will have to adopt your strategy. So what do you use like Calendly then? What do you use? What software do you use? Because I know it's. I don't. So it's just like, so I, I usually have, I will tell you, uh, like I usually have an office manager that does that. We actually just brought somebody new onto the team. So I haven't handed off my calendar uh, as of yet. So I'm handling my calendar, which doesn't mean I <laughs> do it in the best way. I mean, like you and I, when we were coordinating this, I was like telling on myself that I hadn't confirmed. Um, and you thought I was like saying, oh, you hadn't confirmed. I'm like, no, 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 this is me. No, no, no. I was, I, I was taking, I was not blaming you at all. Trust me. It was just like, oh yeah, no, my CEO would tell you, no, you need to follow up with your people. <laughs> yeah. well, see, and you know, my husband is so good at that. Like he literally has a calendar entry at four o'clock every single day. 
that says confirm meetings for the next day. Like he's very good about that. I'm horrible because I've slacked off because I've had somebody do that for me for a long time. But then now that we're gearing somebody else up to do that. And then also too, I mean, I have so many moving parts with all the things that I'm doing right now that it's just like, you got to have ultimate trust when you hand off that calendar. And I had an office manager that was with me for eight years and she was fantastic. And I could totally trust it because she knew, she knew the city too. So she's like, okay, it's going to take her 45 minutes to get there. I can't block somebody there. Like, like all this stuff. And not everybody's good at that. So, um, but I have a lot of friends that use Calendly. Um, Calendly makes me scared. And, And the only reason it does is because I have things that pop up. And so sometimes I need to extend out blocks and I'm like, okay, if I say this is integrated and I say, okay, you can do these times. And then I change my mind. I'm like, I don't want to do that time. Um, then, then it can kind of have some problems, but, uh, so I'm just old school that way. And I, but at least it's not written down. It is in the calendar on the computer and I, it's not like the date book, but I do have friends who do that too. So whatever. Well, it's funny because I have my Google calendar and then I have this thing. Yeah. 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 Yep. There's nothing. Well, there's nothing about writing it down. I bet you the same type of girl as me, where it's like if you make a to-do list, you'll write some things down that you've already done so that you can cross them off and feel accomplished. Right? Yeah. I know. I do the same thing. So it's just like, so I still do like write them down and I'm like, oh yeah, did that, did that. And then I also have a girlfriend, um, one of my best girlfriends that she and I do gratitudes and goals every uh, five days a week. So the work day. And right. so the cool thing about that is like, okay, you're starting your day off with like showing appreciation. It can, it can be something like peanut butter, right? You know, I mean, or just something silly, like, um, you know, like I'm going to Mexico tomorrow. I get the, op- like, it's, it's a lot, but I get the opportunity to go to Mexico to share about my dad and share about pancakes to Roger. That's pretty cool. Right. But, um, and then the, like the goals were like, get your ass home at three o'clock so you can finish packing because after I get back from Mexico, then I'm going to Missouri that same day. So I went ahead and set aside my Missouri clothes because Missouri weather is a hell of a lot different than Mexico in February. So, um, so just kind of doing those things. So those were kind of like the to do's I wanted to get some casework done. I, I had you on the list, um, as things that I needed to accomplish today. And then at the end of the day, then you have things that you feel like, Oh, I put my to-do list on the email and I got those things done and I feel a sense of accomplishment, but if things need to shift, things need to shift. So I think that that's something that people have to be okay with too, because stuff always comes up. So you just have to be a little bit flexible and roll with things too, as they come. Yeah. I love that. I'm like the fly by the seat of my pants girl, like the flexibility, but like also have being rigid. So I'm like, I don't know. I'm just like a foster fuck of shit. (laughs) You're a walking contradiction, yes. I am. That's what I am. I'm a walking contradiction. I yeah, that's who I am. Well, we're I can't believe we went a whole hour. Yeah. It's a 30 minute show, but I love that. Yeah, well, I can talk about anything and you just ask me. Well, and I feel like we're like best friends already. So there there we go. So for all my veteran world out there and allies, yeah. get out there. Get a picture of you eating pancakes with the hashtag pancakes for Roger so that and make it public or private public. Yes, not private. Make it public so that Susan can see it. And her company, um, Combs and Company, will donate to the uh, Missouri Missouri School of Veterans Clinic. Yeah, there we go. The Veterans Clinic in Missouri. And so therefore, um, you know, we can get them their donations. We can get Susan her pictures, and we can have fun while we're doing it. Because well, no, if it's no, not worth, if it's not fun, it's not worth doing. Exactly. Well, and the one thing I will say is, just because like you're not in Missouri or you didn't graduate, doesn't mean that the Veterans Clinic can't help you. So it's just like, so I think a lot of times there's a misnomer that, oh, I have to be from Missouri. Why would I support a clinic in Missouri? Well, this clinic supports people all actually all across the world. They have clients all across the world. So it's just like, just because you didn't go to school there, you're not from there. doesn't mean you can't get help. Um, but I will tell you that um, if you're if you're a veteran or an ally and you're struggling with with a claim, you know, feel free to reach out to me. I can put you in touch with the right people. Or if you live by a major university, check out the, their law school and see if they have a veterans clinic. Because like Syracuse has a fantastic veterans clinic too. So the University of Missouri and Syracuse are known as having, you know, um, the the more successful veterans clinics. But I, I, I know somebody told me um, last week that Harvard has one too. So it's just like so check out if it's a big, you know, big university. 
25,000 students or more, um, chances are they might have, um, might have a clinic too. I love that. And do they charge the veterans for their services? Well, Okay, because that was a question that the Camaraderie Rescue Mission had. I said, I don't think so, but uh, okay, perfect. So, because uh, we have a bunch of veterans, obviously, that we help, and there's always new things coming up. And we, um, so we like to have that in our back pocket of, you know, if somebody needs help, who can we send them to? So I absolutely love that. And I will definitely let our, um, our board know that because that is, that is completely awesome for sure. And you said that like you said, your dad's claim normally would have taken up to seven years and they got it done within three years. So, so I will say that my, so my dad was a judge and he was a general, he knew the right people. So my dad did his claim himself. Um, uh, because we didn't even know about the clinic until, um, because I, I, I sit on a couple of boards for the university of Missouri. And so the Dean of the law school actually came and spoke to one of my boards and that's how I learned of the veterans clinic. And then when my father passed away, um, one of my girlfriends, um, Karen Huffman Grinch, she, she knew that my family was pretty philanthropic and, um, and she knew also too, that my, my dad took care of our family. Like we didn't need to have a GoFundMe account. We did not need help paying for things. Like we, my dad really did a good job at setting things up to take care of his family. And so, um, my brother was a patient at St. Jude hospital. And so that's always been a charity that, or St. Jude that we've always encouraged people to make donations to. And she said, I know that you guys are probably thinking about charities right now. So think about the veterans clinic. And that's how I really got integrated. Um, and I, um, and I on an advisory board for them. And so I do a lot of, a lot of fun stuff for that. And I, you know, it's, they're good people. I mean, Angela Drake, professor Drake that started the clinic, she lost her father in Vietnam. And so she's always had a kinship to, um, to veterans and she was a litigator. And then now she's training all these attorneys, these law students to become advocates for our veterans all across the country. And I think that's fantastic because just having that seed planted within these students, when they go out and have these careers, then they remember it. And so when they come across a client that's, that's a veteran, they're having trouble, then they automatically think about the clinic and how they can help them and use their skills that they've learned as well. Right. I absolutely love that. Yeah. Absolutely. All oh, right. Well, I don't want to take up too much more of your time. <laughs> I know you got a flight to catch. I, I know you got a flight to catch. I mean, we could probably talk all night. Um, but remember to take your pictures of eating your pancakes, hashtag pancakes for Roger. Go to um, Susan's website, well, both of them. Go to www.pancakesforroger.com to get the book, get the story, learn more about, about that. Um, of what we're doing over there and then www.combsandco.com so to get all your insurance and needs that uh, Susan can help you with and if you're not sure what she can help you with go to the website anyways and look and, and it will all be there I'm I just know it will be yeah. <laughs> thank you so much to our guests in the, in the comments and thank you so much Susan for coming on truly appreciate everything that you're doing um, and how you're serving our, our military families. And if there's anything else that we can help you with, please let us know. Um, and huh, if you want to join a, a non for profit military, let me know because I have one that could use your help. <laughs> if you want to collaborate, we're <laughs> always looking for people. Always, 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 always. Why start? Yeah. Why? Why start one when you could just, you know, latch on to some, to to with the good ones that are out there, and you know. To be honest, I want to start a scholarship fund at some point, oh. um, because the GI Bill pays for a lot of things, and um, but it doesn't pay for everything. And I've seen scholarships out there for like. Um, veterans, children, or children of the fallen, but I haven't seen a lot of scholarships for um, for veterans, just like specifically for veterans. And I also think that four year school isn't the end all be all. Um, mm -hmm. So why can't there be a scholarship for Votech schools? Why can't there be scholarships for, say, a certification that somebody wants to get within their their job or a leadership course or things like that? So that's that's kind of what I'm kicking around in my head at some point. Um, so I'm actually on a board of, end of an endowment fund now that gives gives out money. And so um, I'm kind of using that as a learning um, learning time to kind of understand how the endowment works. Because I mean, at the end of the day, an endowment, all it is, is money. So you just got to raise money. You got to raise money and then you can do good stuff. So, um, so that's kind of, I don't know, maybe on the five-year plan we're thinking about. So we'll see. No, you're, you're absolutely right. It's all about 
fundraising, fundraising, fundraising. <laughs> I've been doing that for the last year. I, I get it. I get it. it it's, uh, but you're right. It's getting, doing what you want, doing what you love. And then it doesn't become work and what you're passionate about, right? Which where your heart truly is. So anyways, thank you so much for being on here. Have a safe trip tomorrow to Mexico. <laughs> and uh, we'll definitely have to do like a follow-up show, see where everything, see where everything went. Yeah, that'd be great. That'd be great to see how many pictures we got in and how many thousands of dollars. I, I think we, we donated like um, $5,300 around that last year. So it'll be interesting to see what ends up happening. And if I have to, you know, break open a few piggy banks and find the, or like dig through the, the couch cushions and see if I can find some cash, but it's, you know, it's all for, all for the love and all for a good cause for sure. Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you so much. You. Stay unstoppable in all that you do. And we'll see you same time, same channel next week. Bye for now.